Hello. Hello. So, so did you accept my talk because of the, the donation and the GoFundMe? Is that how I got in? You did not buy your talk. Okay. You did That's not good buy your slot. <laughs> <laughs> but for more money. Right. <laughs> Everything is for sale. All right. So you've been reading the title for a little while now, The Right Way to Do Wrong, Physical Security Secrets of Criminals and Professionals Alike. So the title of this talk is actually based on a book that Harry Houdini wrote in 1906, The Right Way to Do Wrong. And in it, he divulged many of the secrets of successful criminals to, at that time, the largely unaware public. These were the uh, um, fraud schemes and pickpocketing and things like that, that that criminals would run on the street. So I took my inspiration from this. And what I'm going to show you today is a bunch of physical security secrets used by criminals and pen testers alike. So people make assumptions about how different schemes work and believe them to be very complicated. But in many cases, schemes are very simple and straightforward, and it's just a matter of knowing what the secret is. Um, most people will assume that during a physical security test that um, besides tailgating and social engineering, the other way you might get in someplace is to actually pick a lock. That couldn't be further from the truth. The number of times that I have actually had to pick a lock on an engagement are very small. Um, so we also have to understand that some physical controls have very easily uh, known and executed bypasses. And quite frankly, people screw up. So you have locksmiths that put things in incorrectly. And as, as, as long as you know what the, t what the common mistakes are, you can you know, kind of exploit those. So what I'm going to show you today are some of the ways that locks and access control systems can be bypassed without picking. Um, I will say right now I have a ton of links and videos and everything in my talk. Don't feel like you have to take uh, pictures or have me slow down. It's all going to be posted on GitHub, and I will publish the link to that on my Twitter feed. You. You're welcome. So some of the stuff I'm not going to talk about today that are definitely things that you want in your, your pen test bag, these are all electronic things. So, And I'm not going over this just for the sake of time. And each one of these topics, you could have a whole other talk on. And if you think about the relationship to uh, like application security, these are more kind of advanced attacks. How about you make sure that your basic patching is done right first? Like actually have a secure lock and make sure that it's installed correctly before you deal with this uh, higher level threat stuff. So I'm only gonna cover physical methods. Uh, there's no about me. I had an introduction. You can OSINT me online if you want, starting at Twitter and LinkedIn. And I will also nod to my uh, imposter syndrome. <laughs> I may not be the most uh, qualified person in the room. There are probably some super elite red teamers or something like that in here who may know more than me. I love to talk physical security. So if you, you see something that you feel I left out or I got incorrect, uh, let's talk. And special thanks to some people like Deviant, Max Power, uh, Howard Payne, who contributed to this talk and actually reviewed the talk with me to make sure it was complete, and YouTube videos from Lockpicking Lawyer, Bosnian Bill, and Night Owl. Pretty much everything that, that I've learned that I employ on my physical pen tests are from this group of people. And um, my imposter syndrome just got a little bit better before this talk because I literally just put Deviant in a lift. So he's not here to be in the back scratching his chin. <laughs> All right, so consider yourself warned, and it's good this is the end of the conference, so there's not as much opportunity for you to get in trouble. Yes, you're authorized access to your workplace, your hotel, whatever, but you are not authorized to test their physical security controls. Um, it is entirely possible to break something while you're using some of the tools that I'll show you, so don't be that person. And just because something is non-destructive and easy doesn't mean that the local laws don't apply. And I'm going to warn you right now, you will be scarred by this talk. You're going to see things that are suddenly going to like open your eyes and you're going to see this like truly epic security fail stuff all over the place. Um, many of what I'm, many of the things I'm going to show you are locks that are sold in the big box stores. So I won't mention any names, but I basically don't buy any locks at the big box stores. 
This is gonna be super fast, so fasten your seat belt, hold on. All right, so I'm gonna break things down, padlocks, doors, key boxes, common key systems, but starting with padlocks, uh, I typically see these things on document recycle bins, filing cabinets with an external security bar, gates to facilities, things like that. And if you watch uh, YouTube videos from Lockpicking Lawyer, Bosnian Bill, some of the things I'm gonna show you now are what they will do first before trying to actually pick a lock. Let's look for the known common bypasses. So padlock shims. Most of you are probably familiar with the concept of a shim. It's just a thin piece of metal that is inserted between the shackle and the lock body and it's used to push the locking lever away. So the shim that you might have made in the, in the uh, Lockpick Village today or at a previous conference would be made from uh, aluminum can. They do sell these commercially. I don't particularly care for them for padlocks. They're, they can be a little bit thicker than the, the soda can thing, but the upside is they're reusable. You can, you can use them multiple times. Um, most people have learned this attack, of course, with a master combo lock. But what some people don't realize is that it also works on padlocks that have poor tolerances. So if there's a gap in between the shackle and the lock body, the difference is these have two locking levers. So you need to put the, uh, the shim on both sides. So this is a uh, Chinese lock. And you'll see I put the shim in on one side. Give it a, you put it in on the outside and twist it inward so it pushes the locking lever away. And then put the second one in, twist it, and voila. Easy as that. All right, then the next one, this blows people's minds. This is a lever bypass. So some low-end padlocks use just a single locking lever. So it's, it's up here at the top of the lock and that's what presses into the shackle to keep it from being pulled out. And you see down here, this lever is at the very back of the lock, but the lock core of course is taken out in this image. If the back of the lock core is open, you can actually reach a piece of metal through past all the pins and just trip the latch directly. Um, so, this is a demo of that. This tool is actually from Sparrows, and it's called the shank. So um, in the case of master, since there were two different locking levers, they have this thing called the master switch. So you can see there's two pointy parts. One goes in and hits one latch. The other goes in and hits the other latch. You rock it back and forth, and it'll, it'll collapse both. But honestly, I don't, I don't have this in my tool bag. I don't use it because it's typically easier just to rake a master lock open. So it's not really needed. Okay, the, the next thing is warded picks and, and bypass keys. So the warded lock, you, you may recognize this little zigzaggy keyway. And that's one of the ways that you'll recognize a warded lock. They also might be just completely open, like a, oops, a little rectangular. Uh, opening and you can tell it's a warded lock because obviously you won't see any pins and you won't see any wafers inside of them. The, um, the, the way that this actually works is when we say warded, there's actually pieces of metal that are on both sides of the lock and they fit into the notches of the key. And when you turn the key, there is a single lever typically inside of there that will release the shackle. That lever is typically way at the top. So this is what the lever looks like on the inside. And so typically it's only the end of the key that is actually tripping that lever. So if you were to take all this extraneous material off, maybe you wouldn't really need a key. <laughs> so Houdini had his own set. I felt I had to throw that in because warded locks were really popular in his time. But this is what we have now made out of a spring steel, and uh, available for like 10 bucks. And here's how ridiculously easy it is to open these locks. So there's my key. And basically you just run through these one by one until you find one that fits in the keyway and can trip the, la the latch. Yep. Scary, right? 
Okay, the, the next one is actuator bypass, and, and this is a vulnerability that we, f we find on the American 700 and 1100 series, the ABIS 72, and there's actually a ton of other manufacturers, a lot, of, a lot of stuff you'll see from China, and it's like you'll hold the American lock next to this no-name brand that you've never heard of, where they've literally just copied the American design. So if you see a lock body that looks very similar to an American, this might work there as well. So basically what this is, is you take this long thin tool and similar to that, that lever bypass, you go past all the pins and there is a little gap in between the back of the lock here. So this is, this is the actual, the actuator that you're trying to, trying to turn. And this, is, this piece here is the back of the lock. So when, it, when the key is inserted, this part turns and it presses up on this, it turns it clockwise, and then that releases the shackle. So what we do with the bypass tool is go through the lock, out this opening, and jam it right in between this piece and the actuator, and just turn it. So in an effort to try to fix this vulnerability when it came out, American got crafty and said, well, we're gonna put a security uh, wafer in the back so nobody can put but they're trying to retrofit an existing lock. So there's not a whole lot of room to work, work in there. This, this wafer is extremely thin. So Peterson was nice enough to come out with a wafer breaker. So basically you just put it in like the key and go bam with the hammer. Now there's a hole and you can reach right through it. So <laughs> um, I should note that the American 1100 and ABIS 72 are technically lockout tagout locks, which is essentially a lock that you put on machinery when you need to operate it and you don't want to get killed. So their original intent was not necessarily security, it was safety. And consumers don't necessarily understand that, so they're getting this lock that looks tough, but isn't necessarily, you know, for that, that, intent, that use. So here's actually a demo on this uh, cheap master knockoff, or sorry, uh, American knockoff. Just, just as easy as using a key, right? All right, the next, next piece is comb picks or overlifting. You'll see this on uh, padlocks. You'll, you'll notice the padlock body is really wide, but then the core is really small. That's typically one sign that, that this lock could be uh, overlifted. And like the Master 140 is an example of one that this is very effective on. Basically, what, what is going on is the pin chambers where you fit the spring, the driver pin, and the key pin are too long. So there's enough space up here, and you can insert this comb pick and push everything up completely out of the core, and there's nothing stopping the lock from turning. So the tool we, we use is a comb pick. It's available in multiple form factors. Typically, you'll see them for four and five pin locks, mostly for you know four padlocks. And this is the Master 140. <laughs> so yeah, this is, in my go bag, I have just a really small thing of all these, uh, these little tools. All right, the next, the next one is the Sesame Lock. I'm sure everybody's seen these. Um, it's a common design that has ended up getting copied by multiple manufacturers. So if you see one that looks like this, there's a really good chance that it's also vulnerable. Um, the Master 175 is the most common uh, or commonly seen, and you'll see them on construction sites, any kind of public works, because it's easier to distribute a combination and change the code uh, occasionally than it is to hand out you know, 50 keys. The problem with this lock, of course, because it's in my talk, there's a well-known bypass. The most comprehensive breakdown of this vulnerability was done by my buddy Max Power. So you can grab the YouTube link later. This is actually from the Hope Conference in 2018. And he, he takes you through this and, and a lot of other stuff. But essentially the way this works is this, uh, this piece here, the little fingers actually ride on flywheels on the side of the combo dials. And this, this tang, is in the middle of the two locking poles. So it's keeping the poles pushed into the shackle. 
And if you can get some thin piece of metal inside the lock and push on those fingers or manipulate this plate, you can literally pull the tang right out of the spot between the two locking poles. And in this picture I got from Max, he's actually painted it uh, pink so you can see where it is. And I had to circle this in yellow because it's nearly impossible to see this orange handled knife essentially. And that, that's where the, uh, the thin piece of metal from the knife is. So he's actually lifting the tang up and out of the middle of those actuators. All right, so decoding combo locks. Combination locks rely on wheels that the user turns, you know, to dial in the right combo. Uh, essentially, there is a little notch in every single one of these wheels. And your, your object is to try to find where all those notches line up and then rotate all of the wheels forward one at a time. And typically, you can create some binding tension just by pulling in the lock really hard. And then as you turn, it's possible to find where these gates are. In this case, I'm, I'm not showing a padlock. This is actually a like bicycle style like cable lock. Um, and let's run the, run the tape here. This one is, is an extreme example. And watch the gap in between here and the, the dial. See how it moved over? That's how crappy the tolerances are on this. Um, so doing this video, this ends up going around past the number, but you can see where the individual wheels are actually moving back and forth a little bit. And essentially I'm just putting really, really hard tension, pulling on each side. Look at that gap. And it slides all the way over. Right? Like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to make this go like fast, like faster motion, and I just couldn't figure it out. And, and, not quite lined up. Bam. Mm -hmm. Boing. Now we can steal your bike. <laughs> <laughs> as if, as if I would put that on anything. Okay, so jiggler or tryout keys. These sold out in the village really fast. I was surprised at, at how many people were interested in them. Um, these are pretty useful against wafer locks. So wafer lock, as the name implies, and this is, this is a really cheap wafer lock, um, are essentially comprised of multiple brass wafer, wafers, and the tang on the top of the wafer is actually sticking up out of the lock and keeping it from turning. Wafers are normally pushed all in one direction, so they, they're stopping that lock from turning by a spring that is underneath that, that little nub on the, on the wafer. And when we put the key in, it raises or lowers the wafers so that they get out of their own way and allows the lock to turn. These are really common for desk locks, you know, cabinets, uh, storage, like key storage boxes and things like that. Unfortunately, what some people don't realize is this kind of lock is super popular on electronic safes. So you've got your little keypad, but you'll typically see a manufacturer plate or something with their, their brand name. If you take the screws out of that or you pop that piece of plastic out, there's typically a wafer lock behind that. So you don't need to know the, the password or whatever the combo is. You just need a stupid backup key. Essentially, what we what we do here with the jiggler or tryout key, these are just like like a lock pick rake. It's just lots of bumps, and you put some turning tension on it, just like you would for a key, and move it in and out really quickly. And it is essentially like a raking attack against the the wafers. It bounces them up and down. They drop into the right combo, and it opens right up. So unfortunately, this is how bad they are. So there's my little jiggler set, and it works just like a key. <laughs> well, it went in once, and <laughs> all right. So 
Doors, of course, are going to be the most common thing that I will run into on, on assessments. And so this section really covers all the common ways to get in. Uh, door latch bypass or loading tools. We've, quite a few of us have broken in our own house, right, using the credit card trick or maybe somebody else's. And technically, that trick should really not work. Um, it's the principle here is that you either push in on, you're, you're pushing on the curved part of the latch to either push in or reach behind it, depending on how the, the latch is oriented. And um, here's why that attack shouldn't work. So any exterior door, you should have a dead latch on. And the dead latch is this other little piece. So you, you know the main latch and then this little rounded piece that also goes in and out. The problem is that when many homeowners install these types of locks, they will look at the size of the strike plate and the size of the latch, and all of this stuff fits in the hole. So people will install it such that it all goes in the hole. That's incorrect. What is supposed to happen is the dead latch is supposed to be making contact with the strike plate. When the dead latch is pushed in, the latch is locked out in place and you need to insert the key and unlock it to release the dead latch and therefore also manipulate the latch. So go home and check out your doors and I bet you some of you are gonna have this, this dead latch in the hole. So we also see this in commercial setups as well. The dead latch looks a little different. It's not the little round thing, but it is a separate little bar there. And this is what happens when you don't ensure that it's installed correctly. And guess what? That's the network closet. <laughs> so now I can put my little pen test drop box in and get in whenever I want. Um, we, we do see that sometimes you can't even see the latch, but there is another way you can get around this too. Just a thin piece of plastic, will, if you shove it in, will go around basically the corner of the door and trip the latch. And this happens to be on a, in a small server room. Ta-da. Now what some people will do to try to fix that problem instead of you know, actually correcting the latch is just put this big metal plate on it. I'm sure everybody has seen this, right? The problem is it's, you know, it's a lazy patch because it can still be bypassed. So essentially you just need a piece of piano wire or, I don't know, a couple strands of Cat5 uh, wire from, you know, from mined out of it. You just rock it back and forth and it's basically behind the latch and it just trips it. The most common way that I've, I've been getting in places is actually exploiting the lever style handles that are mandated uh, according to the Americans with Disabilities Act. So these were uh, part of commercial code now because frankly some people don't have hands, they don't have fingers. It's easy to just whack it with a nub, you know, whatever you've got. <laughs> um, it also mandates low profile thresholds so a wheelchair can get over it. That leaves people vulnerable to an under door tool attack. So this is essentially just a big piece of kind of thick wire that, that has some, uh, some structure to it and then another thin piece of wire attached to the top. So what we do is we stick it underneath the door and we rock it back until we hear the tool hit the back of the door, slide it across and actually hook onto the lever handle and pull it down. So on the left, this is the uh, inside view and you can kind of see it moving around there. And this is the outside view. Pulled down right there and I'm in. In this case, this was just an entrance to an office suite that had a combo lock on the outside, and this one was actually a carded, a carded uh, door. What? <laughs> um, crash bars and exit paddles. So some doors will have a lock on the outside, but on the inside, you need to have some sort of a panic exit device because if there's a fire, there's a you know, shooting, something like that, people need to get out of the building fast. So they'll put crash bars. This is a lever that releases the dead latch. That's the paddle. And 
if there's any kind of gap in between the doors here, you can get in because there's a tool called a crash bar bypass. Essentially, you stick it in between the door, rotate it, and then when you pull it out, it'll actually press the, the paddle, press the, the, the crash bar, what have you. And the same tool can be used on levers as well. So on the left, this is from uh, CarolinaCon last year when I was demoing it to somebody. And then this is actually on one of my assessments. And you'll see I'm going to trip that lever uh, handle. Ta-da. <laughs> All right. Locks with thumb turn levers. This, this one may be new for a lot of people. So you've seen these all over on retail places, right? And you see the lock in the out, on the outside, and then you get this little, uh, little thumb turn. We typically find these on commercial storefront doors where multiple employees have to lock up. And it's, it also is a safety issue. If you had a lock, I mean, the, the preference would be to have a lock on the inside. But if somebody doesn't have the keys and they need to get out, you, you just you can't have that, right? So uh, fire code will typically prevent people from uh, putting in a lock on the inside. So similar to the crash bar bypass, if there's any kind of gap in between the two doors, you can get this thumb turn bypass tool through the center. And this is actually a cable that goes through here. And when you turn the little uh, knob down here, you saw what happened, it just turned. So this, if you try to buy it in the US, they'll want to charge you about $100, and you have to provide some sort of proof that you're an actually a locksmith. However, if you want the link, I can uh, send it to you. You can get it for $12 from China. It might take a month, but you know, might as well order five. So, <laughs> so here's the, the tool being used by me on an audit. Uh, what I did learn from, from this particular audit experience, too, this was my first time using it was that, that that little clamp can be pretty slippery when, as you're trying to turn it and it, ke it keeps sliding off. So just put a little bit of grip tape on the inside of it and it'll, it'll grab on a little bit better. And the, this is an Adam's right. The way this works is you can undo the lock, but the, the locking bar that comes up, the latch, is actually really substantial. So what I had to do was get it unlocked and then I put the tool in there and yanked the latch down. I think a lot of people probably seen this one, right? This, this got pretty popular, but I had to include this because this is how I get in. Request to exit center sensors, and we all understand that this is what unlocks the door as you're approaching it. These will typically only look for their passive infrared, so they're gonna look for heat, or I should say change in temperature, which is typically heat in the meat space, and uh, some sort of motion. So what that means is that commonly available canned air used for cleaning keyboards, when flipped upside down, is super, super cold, and you just spray it at the rec sensor on the other side of the door. Ta-da! That is exactly what this straw is for. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was, thank you for stealing my thunder there, Dan, because I was literally just going to say here, um, uh, I've also seen disposable hand warmers on a wire, um, helium balloons, exhaled like vape smoke, uh, Deviant posted a video of him doing it with some whiskey, just walking down the street and pfft, unlocked an ATM door. <laughs> um, now, GE does make a, it's the RCR Rex, this actually employs passive, uh, sorry, this also employs active radar, so it's looking for something roughly the size of a human that is, that is moving. So this is the only one that really can uh, defend against that attack. It's sold under multiple brand names, people just OEM it. Adam's right, so you'll see Adam's right all over uh, commercial storefront doors typically, and it's pretty much the most common brand of hardware system for, for retail in the US. They typically have a dead latch that's shown there, and they employ a mortise. This is, this is called a mortise cylinder. The, the little kick cylinders that you have in your door at home look a little different, they're smaller. These are typically open on the back. So 
what you can do is reach through the opening. This is a common theme, right? If you don't have a protection in the back, you can reach through. And this bypass tool is specially angled and designed so that it can reach through and, oops, hit the latch release uh, lever right there. Sorry, not the latch release, the dead latch release. And then what you can do is shim the lock like you would with plastic sheets or uh, you know, a push bar or something like that. Um, Bosnian Bill, of course, he has the best breakdown of this, so I recommend you go watch that for, for more detail. Um, I'm gonna steal from Bosnian Bill a second time here too. The Cabba Simplex, I don't see this, these as much as I used to, but I recently saw one of these on uh, the jet bridge as I was getting on an airplane. I looked over and went, oh, and I had my magnet in my pocket, because guess what? If you put a magnet on the side of this, you can defeat it. And really what's going on, there's a linkage here. If you try to turn the handle, this linkage just collapses and it won't, it won't open the door. If you put the magnet on the side, it pulls this flag out. And by doing that, the linkage will now join up and stay, stay rigid, which allows you to turn the handle. So basically, you want to put this super magnet in like a sock or something so it doesn't get like stuck on the door and you can't get it off. Especially if it's like a metal door, you're never getting it off. Um, put it in a rag, something like that. So uh, just put it on there and it opens up. Now, it isn't very difficult to change the password on these, but we do find a lot of them just still have the same default passcode. And it's a lot of those like contractor put it in, didn't know what combo they wanted to use, assumed somebody was going to, you know, uh, put put a different combo in. So the trick here is if you hit two and four simultaneously and then hit three, that's the manufacturer default. So next time you see one of these, try it out. Or maybe not. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that. Okay. So everybody's seen key lock boxes. Um, Typically in commercial situations, you'll see them on the backs of buildings. Your Airbnb might have one and they'll tell you the code to go get, get the key. Um, some municipalities, especially Toronto, have problems with these. You know, they're like filling up stairwells and the entire railing out in front of an apartment building is absolutely coated with these. These are actual shots from the city of Toronto where they're just all over the place. I'm gonna take you through every single one of these lock boxes and how you can get into them in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, Air, it's Airbnb and yes, I'm never paying for an Airbnb ever again. So um, this master is one of the most common ones that you're gonna see. It's the 5400 rolling wheels for the, the combination. And like many rolling wheel combination locks, they can be decoded using a small piece of feeler gauge. So you stick this in between the dials, and as you rotate it very slowly, there will be a part where your feeler gauge actually drops in a little bit. So you, now you've found the notch, and you go through one by one, find all the notches, and then rotate the wheel, one rotate all the wheels one incre increment at a time until you find the gate and it opens up. Now, I was gonna do a demo video for this, but literally the weekend I sat down, I set up my, my stuff, and I, my phone was literally looking at this lock, and I, my YouTube notification popped up. Yeah, thanks, Deviant just recorded this like super detailed breakdown of it. So I went, well, that's one I don't have to do. So go watch that one. Um, this one, a number of people played with this in the village, and the looks that I got when people opened it up were just like, oh my God. This decoding method works not only on this box, but on numerous others. And basically what you do is put pressure on the, clear, clear the combo first, and then put pressure on that uh, opening lever at the top. And I'm pushing on all the buttons and I'm feeling for feedback, pushing back against my finger. If you feel any sort of feedback, that number is probably part of the combination. Most push button locks like this, you don't have to get the password or the, the combo in any sort of sequence. Each of these buttons are on or off switches, essentially. And you reset the combo by flipping it around and you can flip the, the little knob on the back up or down 
to create your own combo. So 20 seconds. Uh, I actually opened one of these on a recent engagement and it was super fun because there were two keys in it. One went to the telco room and the other went to the fire uh, control room. In the telco room, Sprint, AT&T, Time Warner, all that, they're all coming in, right? And there's a laptop sitting there on a little stand and I'm like, this is out of scope, but I mean, if I just waggle the mouse, that you know, there's no harm in that, right? The thing is unlocked. It, it comes up, it is literally connected to, I probably shouldn't say the name, one of the telco's uh, fiber patch panels. And I'm familiar with that piece of software and it was basically authenticated. So I literally could have gone in and just moved people's stuff around or maybe put in a man in the middle device of some, some kind. The other one, the other room was even better. The fire room had a little box mounted on the side of the wall and it was full keys. <laughs> Guess what? They were the keys, uh, HID cards, alarm, key fobs, all that for the entire building and all of the, all the tenants. So it was just absolutely devastating. So you're, you're using this real low security device to protect high security devices. I mean, there were like uh, Schlag Everest keys in there, which is very, you know, it's a difficult pick, but you know, sorry, I could go on about that one. Uh, the master 5422D and 5423D, uh, the difference is one has the, the shackle up here, one doesn't. Master was trying to up their game and they made this with this, what they call anti-jamming, which is that decoding method when I'm, I'm kind of jamming on the button to feel some feedback. Um, it removes the feedback from the latch mechanism. And as you're, as you're pushing on the latch and you push down on the buttons, you'll actually hear it pop. It'll drop in. And at our last Oak City Locksport meeting in May, I gave one of these to uh, one of our members who's like super good at decoding, and he actually figured out how to beat this. So I am dropping an O-Day today. I've, I've checked with lots of tool chapter leads, and they have never heard of this attack before. Okay, so here's the O-Day. Uh, credit to David S. who figured this out. So it's, it's super easy, and it, was, it shocked me. You take a tension wrench, and you push it down where the combo reset button is, you just jam it in there, and then you do the same thing that you did with the kitty box. <laughs> it was like, wait a minute, they put in anti-jamming and it was supposed to protect against this, but one stupid little tension wrench takes all that protection away. The feedback that you get is a lot more nuanced than with the, the kitty, it, like you're feeling it push back really hard. This is a little more nuanced, but once he told me the trick, and he had changed the code on the box, so I had no clue what it was. It took me 20 seconds to get in. It was crazy. So I will post it. I actually recorded like a three minute video of me breaking it down and going through it. I'll, I'll be posting that on YouTube and I'll tweet that out as well. All right, so tubular locks, I'm not really gonna cover this in any great depth, but uh, tubular locks are essentially pin tumbler locks. The difference here is they have a round keyway and the pins are oriented differently. So the round key fits into it. It pushes in the pins to different depths based on the cuts in the key. And then you hit the shear line and it allows it to turn. They have lots of, of applications like backup, again, backup for an electronic safe. And you'll see it on obviously computer, store, or computer security cables, uh, the occasional storage box that's mounted above a door. So you have the key to the key to the really highly secured door with this real garbage tubular lock on it. And you can actually take a tubular, they call it a tubular pick, but you're not like picking at the individual pins. It's an impressioning device. So you put a, a little bit of tension on the ring on the outside and then push this in and rotate it back and forth. And based on the pressure of the springs coming back at it, it pushes the pins up and you can actually form a key using this. It's not hard to do per se, but it does take a little bit of practice to kind of get it right. So Knox boxes, I just want to touch on this quick because people will see these now and go, oh, well, you could get into that kitty box. You might be able to get into this, right? No, these, these are um, 
they have a, a medi medico biaxial lock that is super hard to pick. These, uh, these boxes, when they're sent from Knox, they're sent with a key that only Knox has access to. The key blank is not available to locksmiths. If you need another key, you have to order it from Knox. There are designated contacts from a municipality that are authorized to order keys and they're all numbered individually. So if one goes missing and it's found, you know exactly who lost that key so they can come after you. These, these are used and you'll see them six to eight feet away from like a main entrance to a building. They're used to store access key, key cards, actual keys, anything that the fire department or law, you know, any law enforcement needs to get into the building. When the, the tenant wants to put something into the box, they don't even have access, so they have to call the fire department, have them come out, put everything in, close it up. You will have one master key for an entire munis municipal area. That might be a problem because accidents happen. And if somebody does lose one of these keys and the person who finds it knows what it is, they now have access to probably every single building in town. And in the case of Austin, the, somebody lost their key and uh, the guy that found it actually went around robbing hospitals and they couldn't figure out what was going on. They finally got him on surveillance video and it was a $300,000 charge to go back and replace the lock on every single one of these boxes. There, there is actually a tamper switch on these so that when the box is opened, you can actually have an alarm go off so we know, okay, somebody opened the box, but in most cases, people don't even bother to, to hook it up, so they didn't know what was going on. So sometimes you can actually have the key that you need in your go bag already, and the reason for this is common keys. Basically, manufacturers will use the same exact lock in their products. So they will, they'll, they'll want to order a bunch of locks, but you know what? It's a lot cheaper to, instead of ordering thousands of key different locks, just order one lock that has the exact same code on everything. And it's fully interchangeable. You don't have to worry about uh, which one you've got. So uh, key to like or common key systems, Deviant and Howard Payne covered this in their talk at the 11th Hope. Uh, this key is, is your key, this key is my key. So I'm gonna do a quick overview and I've actually got another extra nugget here that they didn't cover that uh, Howard helped me out with. So if you've, you've seen uh, this talk and, and some of Deviant's other ones, he has a little keychain. I call mine my keychain of doom. I keep these on them all the time. So C415A, 501CH, and 751, these will get you into just about any cabinet anywhere. Um, Voting machines, that was fun. Jukeboxes, so you can have unlimited songs. Um, industrial control switches and toolboxes. I actually went to Home Depot with these and it was just like unlock, 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 <laughs> like all the way down the, down the row, it was crazy. Um, and if you, oh, the subs, I should say the, the 751, the ladies in my barber shop love me for this. I actually left one there with one of the girls because the owner wouldn't turn the AC up very much in the summer. And I was sweltering. I'm like, it is really hot in here. And I saw the, the thermostat had this plastic box on it. And I'm like, if I could do something about that, would you guys want me to adjust the AC? Like, yeah. So I got out 751, opened it up. And I'm like, let me just leave this with you. So they were able to close it back up. <laughs> so and if you don't have a key and it's in, a, it's in a location that maybe you visit on a regular basis or you've had the opportunity to walk into a business and do some recon, start looking at the face of locks, right? They, they may have a direct or indirect bidding code stamped right on the face of the lock that you can then go look up and order the key that fits that lock. You can also do stuff like uh, look at the, the model or the manufacturer of like office furniture and stuff Herman Miller, you know, you name it, you can literally go online and order a master key for the entire system of filing cabinets and sec secure storage, which is exactly what I did when I bought some used office furniture and they're like four different keys. And I'm like, well, I could order four keys or just the one master key. 
Um, elevator locks have gotten a lot of uh, fanfare, especially these emergency, uh, like fire or emergency operation keys. The FEOK1 is the most common one. It's like the universal standard, unless you're in a state that has a uh, local standard. So you know that if you are going to be in a particular lo locale and um, they have like one that's mandated by the state, you can just order the one that the state uses and now you have control of the elevator. You may remember the incident where the uh, reporter in New York City posted this one. It was like the New York City uh, standard and they got in a lot of trouble for it. But I'm honestly, it's really not surprising at all, right? That law enforcement and fire department would actually have one of these. So here's the extra nugget that I'm dropping. Fire emergency keys have gotten a bunch of publicity, but if you use one of these on a pen test, chances are it's gonna be really freaking noisy. When you engage the fire emergency key, what happens is it says, oh, we need to let all the fire personnel into the building. How are they gonna get in? Probably on the first floor, not the third. So all of the elevators in the entire building will go to the ground level, right? So if you're trying to get in and there's, there's other people in the building, if all the elevators go to the ground floor at the same time, that's super suspicious, right? <laughs> so, so I talked to Howard, I'm like, what can I do to be less noisy? Um, and he said, well, you don't wanna use a fire key, you wanna use a supervisory key. So I'm like, okay, but there's, there's tons of them, I don't know which ones to use. Howard is actually, um, I'm, I'm gonna get his title wrong, but he's like an elevator inspector. He's been working at elevators for years. So he basically said, here's my list. If you're gonna go out and acquire supervisory keys, this will open you know, most of, uh, or this will, will operate most of the elevators you'll find in the US. So uh, take a picture of that one and it'll be posted. Um, You'll see these on apartment complexes and businesses where you might need to talk to a security guard to get in. These telephony access control boxes, um, unfortunately the top two sellers in the market, Door King and Lanier, they've put common keys on these. So uh, the other thing I have on my, my keychain of doom is a key for each of these. And essentially when you open up the front faceplate of the cabinet, on Door King, they literally have a momentary switch. You can press the switch and whatever things it's controlling will, will open up. On the Lanier, there's, a, there's a, uh, a terminal that you actually have to short out and you just carry a little piece of wire, make that, that connection and you know, it opens up. The, the thing to be, be aware of though is this uh, Lanier actually has a tamper switch in it and if you open it up, of course, somebody's gonna get alerted. However, just like the Cabba Simplex, if you put a magnet right up here, that, that switch is just a reed switch. It's just a thin piece of metal that, that goes back and forth. So if you can keep it against the, hello, if you can keep it against the side of the box, then nobody's the wiser. So put it up there, open it up, do your thing, close it up, take the magnet off, nobody knows. Um, Dennis Maldonado had a great talk on this particular system at DEF CON 23. He gets super, super in depth. So if you're interested in learning more about that one, uh, look up his talk. All right, so black bag. When I'm like a proponent of having a black bag that, uh, or go bag that you use for engagements. And I literally have a redundant copy of everything in my my fun you know, play around collection in my go bag. So I don't have to worry, did, did I pick this up or not? And you, know, you don't have to go through a checklist or anything like that. I personally just use a, an old laptop backpack that was given to me from some corporate thing because it looks super corporate and like nobody's gonna, you know, it doesn't look like Tactabro. So nobody's really gonna question it. So your bag doesn't have to be black but some of the essential things for your black bag, your get out of jail free or authorization to test letter, super important if, if you're doing this like after hours and nobody knows about it. Um, and the bag should kind of fit your pretext. For me, the laptop thing works because I'm a middle-aged like white dude um, with a laptop backpack. It's super non-threatening. If you're a woman, like play to people's stereotypes of you, have a big purse. Right, they just won't even, they won't even think of it. 
it, if those types of pretexts don't work for you, of course, the, the one that everybody talks about, the yellow maintenance vest with a clipboard, Deviants uh, shown like he'll have a clipboard that's like really thick, one of the ones with the lid that opens, and you can have a bunch of your tools in there. Um, basically, fit preconceptions, fit into people's desire to help, and you'll you'll get pretty far. So specific tool wise, I, I pretty much covered all of these. Um, the ones that I didn't cover that I, I keep in my bag all the time, I've got a couple of different uh, plantable micro cameras a little body camera that you can have running the entire time. It's like the little pen form factor, completely innocuous. It, it, it'll help with recording and engagement as well as like just standing the right way and capturing somebody punching in a pin code. Um, tape is used for neutralizing door latches. So if you can get in um, or somebody opens the door and you're not going in, you'd, oh, I'll hold the door for you. And you're not trying to get in, but you just put a piece of tape on the latch and now you can go along later and just open it up. Um, and then uh, the uh, magnetic pole detector is used for detecting whether or not a door that you're going to try to get through is alarmed or not. And you literally just run it all the way around the outside of the door and you'll see the polarity indicator flip. So now you know either don't work on that door or there's some alarm bypass methods you can go through using magnets and things like that. So. Um, that is that is it for the black bag. So some of the, some of my conclusions here. Don't go for the advanced stuff first, right? Do your basic patching, proper install. Don't allow gaps around uh, around your doors and stuff. Don't assume that an access control device is going to be used the way it was designed to work. Obviously, all those bypass attacks we we exploited a flaw in the design. Don't rely on a less secure method. Uh, to secure high security keys and do your research. So if you're gonna gonna pick up a lock uh, Or if you've brought one home look on lock picking 101 go to the uh, Lock picking reddit go to YouTube find that lock and, and you can literally Google like to make make and manufacture the lock and bypass or picking and if you can find a, a exploit for it ditch that lock and get something else and with that, thank you. That's all I got.